Shabbat Shalom, everyone, and welcome to Cornerstone's Torah Midrash service for today. I thank everyone who's here in the audience, and then also everyone who's joining us online. We have people in several different states and a couple different countries that do join us. So welcome to them, and Shabbat Shalom. Now, we have a little bit of a visual challenge. I've let most of you know, if you, the farther you sit back today, the easier it will be for to see the, uh, the screen up there. Uh, we had a fantastic vacation Bible school, and in second service, you get to hear a lot more about it. But in the meantime, we, you are sitting in the passenger seats of a jet airplane going to Jerusalem. So I hope you brought your passports. All right. If we could have everyone rise, and then I will do the blessing of the Torah reading. Barku et Yahweh Hamivarak, Barku et Yahweh Hamivarak, Lelam Vahed, Baruch Yahweh Hamivarak, Lelam Vahed, Baruch Atah Yahweh. Eloheinu melech haholam, asher bakar banu mikohamin, venetan lanu et torato, baruch ata Yahweh, baruch shemo, noten ha-Torah, amen. And now in English, blessed are you, Yahweh our Elohim, King of the universe, who has chosen us from among all peoples and gave us his Torah. Blessed are you, Yahweh. Bless his name, giver of the Torah. Amen. There we go. Today's uh, Torah portion, and again, we have, uh, for some of the new people, we do have these out in the hallway. And it goes through the first five books of the Bible in Greek. If you prefer Greek, it's the Pentateuch. And if you prefer English, it's the books of Moses. But it's the first five books. So in Hebrew, it's the uh, Torah, which means instruction. As that's what that means. So we go through them as a foundation all year. For a whole year, we're on a, we're on a, there's different schedules. We're on this one here. And then that way we get through all five books in one year. And then we celebrate it, and then we can start again. That's for the first service. It's like laying the foundation for building a big, you know, like multi-story uh, complex. That's what the Torah is for us. <clears throat> and you're free to take some of those if you would like. Today is number 44. We actually get to start a new book today, which is Deuteronomy in English, or Devarim in the Hebrew. And the uh, Torah portion this week is named Devarim because it means words. It's basically what it is. And the words of Moses, or Moshe in, in Hebrew. And the entire section is Deuteronomy 1.1 through chapter 3, verse 22. Uh, for the sake of time, we'll take a portion of it and read it. And every year, we'll read uh, different sections. But you're always encouraged to read all of it on your own during the week. This week's reading will be Endeavoring chapter 3, and that's verses 1 through 22. And do I have a volunteer who would be willing to read. Miranda's not here, she usually volunteers. We have one, Micah, fantastic buddy. One through 22? Yes, sir. Then we turned and went up by the way uh, to Bashan and Og, sovereign of Bashan, came out against us. He and all his people to battle at Adir. And Yahweh said to me, do not fear him for I, I have given him and all his people and his land into your hand, and you shall do to them as you did to the Shion sovereign of the Amorites who dwelt at Heb Heshaban. So Yahweh our Elohim also gave into our hands Og sovereign of Bashan with all his people, and he smote him unto until he had no survivors remaining. And we captured all his cities at, at that time. There was not a city which we did not take from them. Sixty cities, all the direct, all the district of Argob, the reign of Og in Bashan. 
All these cities were fenced with high walls, gates, and bars, besides a great many unwalled towns. And we put them under the ban as we did to Shion, sovereign of Hezbon, putting the men and the women and the children in every city under the ban. But all the livestock and the spoil of the cities we took as booty for ourselves. And at that time, we took the land from the hand of the two sovereigns of the Amorites that was beyond the Yardin from the Wadi Aron Mount mm -hmm. of Haran. <clears throat> oh, that's a hard name. It is, and you're doing fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> Tis Donians call Haran Siren, and the Amorites call it Sinir, and all the cities in the plain of Galad, and all and all Bashan, as far as Salka and Adiri, cities of the reign of Og in Bashan. For only Og, sovereign of Bashan, was left of the remnant of the Rephites. Mm -hmm. See. His bedside, as in iron bedside, it is not in Rehab of the children of Ammon. Nine Ammon in its length, and four Ammon its width, according to the Ammon of a man. And this land which we possessed at the time from Arur, which by the Wadi... Arnon and the half mountains of Galad and its cities I gave to the Reubenites and the Gadites and the rest of the Galad and all Bashan, the reign of Og, I, ha I gave to half the tribe of Manasseh, all the district of Argob with all Bashan called the land of the Rephites, Yari, son of Manasseh, had taken all the district of Argob as far as the border of the Jesuites and the Mecca, <laughs> Mecca Hittites, and called them called them after his own name, Abishan, Hareth, Yari, to this day. And to Maker, Maker I gave Gilad, and to the Reubenites and the Gadites I gave from Gilad as far as the Wadi Aran, the middle of the Wadi as the border, as far as the Wadi Yaqob, or Yab, Yabok, the border mm -hmm. of the children of Ammon. And the desert plain with the, with the Yardin as the border from Kinnereth as far as the Sea of Arabah, the salt sea below the slopes of Pisgah on the east. And I commanded you at that time, saying, Yahweh, your Elohim has given you the land to possess. All the sons of might pass over armed before your brothers, the children of Israel. But let your wives and your little ones and your livestock, I know that you have much livestock, stay in your cities, which I have given you, until Yahweh has given rest to the brothers as to you, and they also possess the land which Yahweh, your Elohim, has given them beyond the Yardin, then you shall return each man to his possessions, which I have given you. And I commanded Yahshua at that time, saying, Your eyes have seen all that Yahweh your Elohim has done to these two sovereigns. Yahweh does the same all the reigns which you are passing over. Do not fear them, for Yahweh your Elohim himself fights for you. Fantastic. You deserve an extra treat this week. You had some tough ones. All right. Now we're going to do.
we're going to thank the Lord for the Torah that he has given us. And this is the blessing afterwards. Um, I'll do the leader part in the, in the Hebrew, and then we'll do the Hebrew down below together, just like we did the first time. And then we'll go back through in English. Baruch atah Yahweh, Eloheinu melech haolam, asher natan lanu toret et mer, vechaye olam natabet et chenu, Baruch atah Yahweh, Baruch shemo, noten ha-torah, amen. Blessed are you, Yahweh our Elohim, King of the universe, who has given us the Torah of truth and planted everlasting life within us. Blessed are you, Yahweh. Bless his name, giver of the Torah. Okay, you can be seated. Thank you. Now, I'm standing back here because I can see the slides better, too. <laughs> but I really wanted to make sure you guys could see those. Um, the fantastic display. That, every time I look at that artist work, I just, it makes me homesick. I want to go home. I want to get on that plane and go flying over. Now, in this week's Torah uh, parasha, the subject headings, uh, we have in chapter 11, we have the command to leave Horeb, which is a picture right up there. And then leaders are appointed, Israel's refuse, refusal to enter the land, followed by the penalty for Israel's rebellion. Then in chapter 2, we have the wilderness years and the defeat of King Sihon. And then in chapter 3, we have the, the defeat of King Og. Okay. And when we're doing the, uh, I have some questions prepared, but I also like to have people read it ahead of time and then um, bring up any questions or observations they have during the week. Uh, but while we're doing this, uh, while discussing this parasha, keep in mind two questions. Where is Yeshua in this? And then the second one is, how is this parasha relevant to us today? Fascinating history, a lot of geography, which is why I had a lot of maps up. I can go back over those again. Um, but again, that's interesting, but how is that relevant to us today? Okay. So, there we go. So, I have that up for now, but was there anything that anybody else had read through this week? Uh, also, with the new people, uh, I send out a worksheet that you would have been hopefully handed out in front. I think you were. Pat's a very a good greeter, and she makes sure you get that. We uh, actually, I email this out to a list of people. All you have to do is give me your email, and I'll send it out. It's usually every Wednesday. This next week, I won't be here, so I won't be doing that. But otherwise, I send it out Wednesday. It gives you a few days to go over it, so that when you come to class, you can have answers. Sometimes you don't have a lot of time. Some people do, but it really does depend. But at least it also gives you a good idea of where we're going with some of the questions I have. But again, this is a midrash. It's a, it's a guided midrash, but this is a midrash, which means we discuss. And it's more, the more participation that you guys do and research you do, than the less I do, which I think is good. I have a lot prepared, but you know, sometimes we only get through one or two questions, we're having such a good time, and it's a good discussion, you know. So is anybody, uh, anything for this week? We have Darren there. Well, a couple things stood out to me in this portion, which yeah. I say that every week. But <laughs> <laughs> um, one of the things, it's mentioned in chapter one and repeated in chapter three, is what he read, passing over the Jordan. And I believe uh, there's pun intended in that, that mm. it points to the Passover, mm. that that is the way we receive our promise. Mm -hmm. Our inheritance is by the blood of the Lamb. And I believe that Yeshua's in that statement. And it's through the Passover, and that's the only way we're, we're going to receive our inheritance. Mm -hmm. Another one um, that is in one and repeated in chapter two that. I really, really caught my eye uh, more for the first time was mm -hmm. when Moses says uh, he's not allowed to go into the land mm -hmm. for your sakes. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, what for? But he got angry with them. 
Yeah. And I've had a lot of discussions about righteous anger. So many people come to me, well, that's righteous anger. Uh -huh. But our fight is not against flesh and blood. Right. And we need to keep that in mind. And so that's repeated in both. Why he ain't going. And this is the man that when Yahweh says, I'll start all over with you. He went to his knees and begged mm -hmm. for their lives. And that's the proper stance that we take. Mm -hmm is humbling ourselves on our knees and praying to him for him to give us victory. A very good point. And just uh, for some of you, this is very, very, you already know this, but I'm just making sure because we have different people. Uh, right here is the Jordan River. It starts here. This is, it's, we call it the Sea of Galilee, but it's really the Canera when you're over there in, in Israel. And first, I kept going, where's the Sea of Galilee? And they're looking at me like, oh, a tourist. Well, then I found out they call it the Canera. But it's just this little bit of strip right down there is the Dead Sea. It's really not that long of a river. It's, I don't remember how far, but it's not very far at all. I remember Israel at the top, when you're up here, you drive all the way down south, it takes you about six and a half hours driving. If you were you know, driving like a freeway speed, it's not very long. So it's a really short, short river. But that's where he said they were crossing over. Over right now, we're in this part, they're going to cross over. They're going to pass over the river, just like they did when the Lord passed over them and saved them. That's what, yeah, yeah, it's pretty amazing. Anybody else? Okay, we'll go to, I had a previous slide here. This also is in here because um, I wanted to put the picture of the bed next to this because it's right there. But then I really realized that this is also showing you, this is after the lands were divided up with the tribes, and it gives you an idea. Here's uh, Gilead, and this would be Bashan, okay? Damascus is about right over in there. But you can see where Reuben got some, uh, Gad, we say it's God in Hebrew, and then Manashe, half here and half here. Half the tribe went one side, half the tribe went the other side. We talked about that a little bit last week in Numbers. Okay. Yeah, Jill. Um, this was, had to do more with, you know, just like an observation that I had. Yeah. Um, in Deuteronomy 2, 5, where Yahweh says, Meddle not with them, for I will not give you of their land. No, not so much as a foot breath, because I have given Mount Seir unto Esau for a possession. And... Um, it always impresses upon me when I see how Yahweh treats uh, what we would call, um, you know, the unchosen, either Esau or even Cain, um, uh, you know, whoever you want to pick out of the Bible that supposedly we, we look down on. Um, and Yahweh always, he always follows through with his word. He, you know, he gave Cain um, special allowances to make sure he was okay, um, and things like that, that, you know, Esau, he says, Yaakov, have I loved, Esau, have I hated. But if we look and see how Yahweh loves and hates, I think it's a lot different than our Hollywood understanding of love and hate. Mm -hmm. um, and so he, you know, the people that he hates, quote unquote, he treats with tremendous respect and follows through on his word, et cetera, et cetera. And it's just, it's a very good lesson for me in mm -hmm. how I treat people in my life. I had heard someone suggest that at the time, you always have to go behind the English to look at the original language. And Hebrew was one of those type of languages that you could use about 30 words in English to describe it sometimes. They're that deep. You know, so we're looking at a mustard seed in English, but it's actually like a whole tree. And sometimes, sometimes it isn't. But sometimes with the hate in certain situations, if you look at the context, sometimes it means they, that love less. It doesn't mean like, I'm going to, you know, fry you and kill you and do all these terrible things. It just means love less. And, and Jill has a very good point. Um, Hagar, when she cried out with Ishmael, the Lord blessed him. Now, it wasn't the blessing, quote unquote, that's passed down from Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, because it's not the God of Abraham, Ishmael. It's the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. He didn't get those promises, but he got other ones. When Jacob, with his mom, tricked his dad into giving him the, first, the firstborn birthright, he did get it. And Esau was going, uh, oh my goodness, dad, what happened? Uh, you know, I'm left destitute. And he said, no, no, 
I'll, I'll give you a blessing also. And he did. Even though Esau would have led the family away from following Yahweh, he still did do that. In mercy, really. Yeah. He not only blessed the uh, Edomites, Esau's descendants, but Lot, which is in this. Yep. Who, these are descendants from them yeah. sleeping with their father. Yeah. And he still blesses them mm -hmm. and puts a protection over them. Mm -hmm. and, and the other is the descendants of Ishmael. Mm -hmm. All three of these. Mm -hmm. He shows mercy. His mercies are everlasting. Hallelujah. Amen. So as a little bit of a review now, as the Israelites are coming out of Egypt, they cross over really in the north and southern, uh, northern, what we call Saudi Arabia today. Okay. And then they're going up. Now they're going to run into their cousins. And those are the Edomites. Lord said, don't touch their land. I've given that to them. Okay. Then he goes up and there's Moab, which is one of the children of Lot. Nope. Don't touch their land. I've given that to them. And then up here is Ammon, which is children of Lot. No, don't touch them. Here's this way in between. And that's the way they're going. And once they go through into there, they conquer some of the areas that come out and challenge them. But then they hit um, the Heshbon and the Gilead, the Gilead land, and then they're hitting Og just above it. So that's the route they're taking, which to me is phenomenal. It's just the Lord was very careful about that. He was, he was um, very protective of them. So the first five subject readings seem to be a review. Review, 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 okay? My question was, two questions, why is this review included in the Torah, and how is this, or is this relevant to us today? It's really quiet in here. I know everyone's trying to warm up. We have the air conditioner on, so you should feel energetic exhausted with the heat. So we have Tim's running over here. Good. Oh, hi, Miranda. Sorry, we have germs, so we're sitting over here. But <laughs> um, So the word remember is used in Deuteronomy at least 15 times. <laughs> yes. That's right. Why? Well, just, just, do you want me to get... <laughs> just thinking about it. Why, why do you think? Think of human nature. To, uh, so that we, we do what we say we're going to do, so that we keep our yeah. end of the covenant, so that um, we have a relationship with him, mm -hmm. so that um, we don't, we're not um, satisfied and happy and think that we did it ourselves, but we <laughs> remember him and... Amen to that. Amen to that. It's also human nature to forget. It's really, really easy for us to forget this. And so the Lord knows that. I mean, he made us, so he knows our faults. So he wants us to remember we need to go over it again and again and again. Yeah, Jill. And pretty much what you just said, uh, that, you know, we're, it's a continual struggle uh, with our flesh versus our spirit. Um, so... We have to get review. I mean, we just did a whole week of <laughs> vacation Bible school, mm -hmm. a very, very base. You know, it's the first thing you hear all the time when you are accepting Jesus for the first time. And I never felt bored because those are, I mean, love God and love your neighbor. You know, how many mm -hmm. of us do that perfectly? <laughs> so it's something that I can work on for the rest of my life, pretty much. Amen to that. Amen to that. So I have a couple of scriptures here. Um, again, you can write them down if you want as we're moving that. Is Roy there, has something. As we well. got Roy over there. As you're doing that, um, uh, either that or once we roll this video onto YouTube, then uh, go back and, and write them down then in case you, you can't do it right now. That's what's nice about YouTube. You can pause it and then write the stuff. Down. I do it all the time, and it helps. Yeah, Roy. Yeah, my comment was um, we have to remember even in those days, there was a younger generation coming up. That's why we need the repetition, because they're not aware of the history that preceded. Amen. That is a fantastic point. Yeah. We also, I think, have to remember, you know, this is the book that 
Yeshua referred to, I mean, not this time, but in this book, mm -hmm. of uh, when he was tempted. And these words were written on his heart, just as they're to be written on our heart as well. And when it says, remember, 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 and we begin to look at this. And uh, I love how it talks about passing over the Jordan because so many times the passage of through water is used mm. and yet it's still used today with the baptism that we see in our lives as well mm -hmm. and passing through that water mm -hmm. be delivered on the other side. And we see that all the way through the Torah as we read through it. And we just have to remember that today, the significance of that as well in our life today. And it's a beautiful thing. Amen. So I like Roy's point also that you have a new, new generation. Remember the first generation, they totally gummed up royally, like two or three, like 10 times totally. And then the Lord said, okay, I'm going to wipe you all out. That was brought up. It's like, no, 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 no. Please don't, Moshe intercedes. And then he goes, okay, I'll work with their children. So now he's working with their children and they're getting ready to go over. So now it's time to go back over everything again. Uh, so that does help because maybe the parents told them, maybe they didn't, we don't know, but they're going back over with them. Okay, so you have that as a second uh, reason for them to remember. Yeah. So the <clears throat> Yahweh is divvying out the reward for the 40 years of obedience that Israel has just shown. Hmm. And just like he will one day for all of us. But what I found to be relevant to what's going on today is he tells us, our brothers and sisters, to house our brothers and sisters in our cities that we already have until the rest of the rewards can be divvied out without fear. And, you know, he talks about how there's a lot of cattle. <laughs> it's mm -hmm. going to be crowded. But we have to hold each other up while Yahweh is giving our brothers and sisters their reward for their obedience as they start coming or as they have been coming in to their obedience. Are you talking about when they didn't put them all in the cities there and then they cro then crossed over to help them conquer that? Yeah, I mean, that's what he yeah. says. Right. I'm just making sure. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. 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 That makes a lot of sense. Yeah, if you read through that. Some of the tribes liked it on the right side of the Jordan, so they approached Moshe, and then it got discussed out, <laughs> and it turned out that they could stay there, but they had to make a pledge, they had to vow, we talked about those last uh, couple of weeks, that um, once they took over the fortified cities, re refixed them, got their women and children taken care of, their cows taken care of, then the men had to cross over the Jordan and, and conquer the lands until they were released from that vow, then they could come back. And that's what she's talking and about. And the there. women and cattle from the other tribes yeah. could then leave the cities and take yeah. their reward. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, that's a very good point. I'm glad you noticed that. That was way cool. A couple of the scriptures, uh, ex and these are just a couple. Okay, Exodus 13, 3, which we wrote, uh, read a few weeks back. And Moshe said unto the people, remember this day, there it is again, remember this day, in which you came out of Egypt out of the house of bondage. This has to do with Passover, of the feast of Passover, okay? And then the, um, the beginning of unleavened bread season, the first fruits. For by the strength of hand Yahweh brought you out from this place, there shall no leavened bread be eaten. So we're to remember that it was Yahweh's strong right arm that got them out of Egypt. If we forget that, you and I would not even know this existed. If they had forgotten, we wouldn't even have a Bible. We wouldn't have it. They would have forgotten it. And then, you know, I'm thinking of the very saintly people back in the early 60s who witnessed to me when I was going to a church and just a boy. If they had forgotten, they wouldn't, I would never have known. We wouldn't have had VBS school last week. But you guys are remembering and everyone who volunteered, which is phenomenal, you remembered and you taught the next generation. It's got to be passed on. Hosea, this is a very famous one, in chapter four, verse six, but I'm gonna quote the whole verse. It's usually fractured off. My people are destroyed for the lack of knowledge. That's what you usually hear. 
But the rest of it says, because thou hast rejected knowledge, I will also reject thee, that thou shalt be no priest to me, seeing thou hast forgotten the Torah of thy God. I will also forget thy children. So it's not knowledge in general, it's the knowledge of Torah, which is the foundation. Okay, that's the teacher, that's the nanny, that's the kindergarten teacher, as my wife said, she's a retired school teacher, that teaches us to go through life. It's instruction, instruction on how to live your life, and it sends us straight at Yeshua. Jesus in, Jesus in English, you know, like Jesus in Spanish, okay, you can pick your language. But it goes straight at him, okay? To me, without Messiah Yeshua, Torah is unfulfilled. It's totally unfulfilled. It, it's not just to be there and hang out. It's not a destination. Uh, Colossians <clears throat> chapter 1, verse 9. That is, that is also why we, from the day we heard, have not ceased praying for you. This is uh, Paul talking and asking that you be filled with the knowledge of his desire in all wisdom and spiritual understanding. So if you want spiritual understanding, you need to remember. Because if he gives you the knowledge and it just goes in like whoosh, right out and you don't remember, she's got the man. Okay, good. Then why should he give you the knowledge in the first place? It's not going to do you any good. Yes, ma'am. I was recently doing a study on the Hebrew word in the Hebrew for knowledge uh -huh. and trying to understand what does that really mean? What is he saying my people fail for a lack of it? Mm -hmm. And what I found is the actual translation says intimacy. Mm. It's intimacy with Yah. It's intimacy with, his, with the Torah. And when you're intimate with something, you are very, very familiar with it. Again, go, coming back to a remembrance. Mm -hmm. And I believe that without a remembrance, we'll, the mistakes we've made in the past, we'll, we'll make them again. If we forget where we've made a mistake, mm -hmm. we'll continue that mistake over and over again. So the intimacy with the Lord, I believe, is, is really pertinent to what we're talking about. It's getting close. I agree. That's a very, very good point. Yeah, Tim. I would also, to kind of go off of that, would say that it's that branch, vine and branches analogy that Yeshua gives, that we have to abide in him and remain in his love if we're to be fruitful. And that is intimacy. Intimacy. Very good point. Thank you. That was very good. So I want to add to what my <laughs> sister said and not really add anything, but that's a very important point because mm -hmm. we go back to the Garden of Eden, the tree of knowledge mm -hmm. of good and evil. How could knowledge, so we'd say, how could that be bad? But if you take it in context of what she just said, mm -hmm. you're being intimate with evil. You may be even being intimate with good but and evil. And evil. It's not the tree of life. Good point. Good point. I have another one here in Second Peter, or Kepha in the Hebrew, 2.20. Um, for if after they had escaped the pollutions of the world through the knowledge of the Lord and Savior, Yeshua HaMashiach, they are again entangled therein and overcome. The latter end is worse with them than the beginning. So they got the word and they chose not to do it. Some of that can be you forget. But you just, I'm not going to do this. I'm not going to remember. I'm going to remember what I want to do or something. It's actually worse for you. That's why it's really important to remember. Okay. And I have one more. And there's tons of scriptures. I think Psalm had like 30 of them or something. So, and like Miranda was saying, there's like 15 in Deuteronomy and Deverine. Uh, Jude 1, uh, chapter 1, well, the whole book's chapter 1, verse 5. I will therefore put you in remembrance, though ye once knew this, so again, he's even saying, look, you're supposed to remember this, how that the Lord, having saved the people out of the land of Egypt, afterward destroyed them that believed not. So I try to show in the Tanakh of the Old Testament and the Brit Hadashah of the New Testament, the relevancy, the consistency of that message going all the way through. That's one of the things we try to do here also. Okay, question number two, which is hard to see. Uh, it's below the camels, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> but I'll read it here. Uh, read the sections called Israel's Refusal to Enter the Land, which is in chapter 1. The Penalty for Israel's Rebellion, also in chapter 1. And then as an encouragement, read the book of Jonah. I put chapters 1 through 3, but it's usually about the last first three or four verses of chapter 3. Because they're obviously in rebellion here. Open rebellion. And the Lord says, you're not going in the land. And then it occurred to me to think about Jonah 
he was openly rebellious. He pulled a Jonah, is now afraid. <laughs> he gets on the ship, and instead of going to the Assyrian, he goes all the way the other way, 180 degrees as far as you can go. They're both open rebellion, but I think if you read the stories, and also David, King David too, um, they're different results. Why? And I think this is very relevant to us today because if you open rebel against the Lord, you'll know how to come back. That's really, really important. Okay? So looking at the scripture, if we remember what the stories are, you'll know the pattern to follow. King David is another example of a good way to do it. Jonah is fantastic. And then also a bad one is King Saul. What do you do? Yes, ma'am. I'm sorry. I guess I don't see that there are different results. Can you please explain what you mean by different results? Yeah. It's in the scriptures. So, and it takes a sec to read through them, but they're both in there. They both open really rebel. Okay. So, in uh, Deuteronomy... Uh, notwithstanding, you would not go up, but rebelled against the commandment of Yahweh your Elohim. This is in Deuteronomy 126, and I'm going to read down a little bit. And ye murmured in your tents and said, Because Yahweh hated us, he hath brought us out forth, us forth out of the land of Egypt to le- deliver us into the hand of the Amorites to destroy us. It's all negative. They not only rebel, they're complaining. And they're being unfactual, really. They're just being blinded by this thing. This is really, really not good, okay? Yet in this thing you did not believe Yahweh your Elohim. That's what they are condemned for a few verses down. And Yahweh heard the voice of your words and was wroth. And he swear, which is an oath. If you look at that, it's the same word for oath. Saying, uh, then ye answered and said, oh, saying, um, and he, he basically condemned them for what they had done. I'm doing this for a little bit of brevity's sake if you read through the whole thing, okay? So they rebelled. Then they basically were complaining and saying bad things about the Lord, bad things about this whole journey, going back through the same stuff, you know, the whole 10 reasons why they rebelled. And then the Lord said, okay, you're all going to die. Oh, oh, right, Lord, we just kind of mixed, messed up here. No, we'll go in now. And the Lord said, saying to them, go not up, neither fight, for I am not among you, lest you be smitten by your enemies. Okay? So you can see that pattern of what they, and sure enough, they were smitten. Okay? Yeah. No? Okay. And then, uh, so I spake unto you, and you would not hear, this is the Lord talking about, rebelled against the commandment of Yahweh, oh, this is Moshe, and went presumptuously up into that hill. Okay? So have that picture in your mind versus Jonah, okay? Now the word of the Yahweh came unto Jonah, the son of Amittai, saying, Arise and go to Nineveh, that great city, and cry against them, for the wickedness has come before me. But Jonah rose up to flee unto Tarshish, completely the other way from the presence of Yahweh, completely rebelled against it. Okay? So it's, it's fairly similar right now. And went down to Yapa, and he found a ship going to Tarshish, which they estimate that Tarshish was probably in Spain. So Assyria is up in Iraq. Okay, and he's going to Spain. Oh, totally the other way. Um, and, and he was fleeing from the presence of the Lord. And they said, everyone to his fellow, once the storm hit, come and let us cast lots that we may know for whose cause the evil is upon us. So they cast lots and the lot fell upon Jonah. So they knew it was Jonah that was causing the storm that was sinking the ship. I'm skipping just a tab because of time. But read the whole section. It's very, very good. And there were men exceedingly afraid. And they said unto him, Why hast thou done this? For the men knew that he had fled from the presence of Yahweh because he had told them. That's a little different. Then said they unto him, What shall we do unto thee, that the sea may be calm unto us? For the sea wrought and was tempestuous. To me, this is where the, the story now changes a little. Did Jonah go down in the belly of the ship and murmur and complain? Did he talk to them and say, Oh, well, you know, it's because it's this God thing, man. He, he's doing all this stuff. You should be mad at him. That's not what Jonah did. He changed. He said, and he, being Jonah, said, said unto them, Take me up and cast me forth into the sea, so shall the sea be calm unto you. For I know that for my sake this great, great tempest is upon you. He humbled himself. 
What did David do when the prophet Nathan confronted him about the uh, murder and the adultery? He said, I have sinned, and he hit the deck. King Saul did not. King Saul made excuses, and that's why the kingdom was torn from King Saul that day by the prophet Samuel, the seer Samuel. It was a, to me, a huge, huge difference. And then I was going to read Jonah's prayer, which is remind me so much of King David when he was praying also. You want me to read that, or do you want to go first? Okay, good. So in Jonah chapter 2, then Jonah prayed unto Yahweh his God out of the fish's belly which is another story into itself, and said, I cried by reason of mine affliction unto Yahweh, and he heard me. Out of the belly of hell cried I, and thou heardest my voice. For thou hast cast me into the deep, into the midst of the seas, and the floods compassed me about. All thy billows and thy waves passed over me. Then I said, I am cast out of thy sight, yet I will look again toward thy holy temple." And that's where Yahweh resides on earth. So he's looking to the Lord. The waters compassed me about, even to the soul. The depth closed round about me. The weeds were wrapped about my head. He's, he's done. I went down to the bottoms of the mountains. The earth with her bars was about me forever. Yet hast thou brought up my life from the corruption. O Yahweh, my Elohim. When my soul fainted within me, I remembered Yahweh. And my prayer came in unto thee, into thine holy temple. And we just got done doing a long series at the men's group about our words in heaven. It takes a lot of work. You have to have the right pathway for our words to get into the holy temple. Jonah's did. Totally opposite of the Israelites when they were murmuring. Okay. Um, and they, are they that observe lying vanities forsake their own mercy. But I will sacrifice unto thee with a voice of thanksgiving. I will pay that that I have vowed. Salvation is of Yahweh. Very different than the Israelites. Okay. And the difference? Yahweh spake unto the fish, and he vomited out Jonah upon the dry land, which is way cool. He didn't die in the fish. They died in the desert. He didn't. And the word of Yahweh came under Jonah a second time. It did not come to the Israelites, except to say, you're dying. Okay? Arise, go unto Nineveh, that great city, and preach unto it the preaching that I bid thee. So, and this is verse 6, so Jonah arose and went unto Nineveh according to the word of Yahweh. Completely different. Okay? So, yeah, that's a theme throughout all Torah. Even... Uh, when we're looking at the priest and the, the temple um, being put out of the camp for being unclean, anybody that's put out of the camp for being unclean, or the wrath of Yahweh when he speaks of his wrath, it's all, every one of those instances is to bring us to our knees, to repent, yeah. to be clean, and come back into the camp. Mm-hmm. That's, that's what it's about. It's redemption. And he, and he does this sometimes when he disciplines those who, who he loves so that we can be in the camp, so we're, we'll get clean. Mm -hmm. So it's, it, he, he, everybody has a choice at any moment in life to fall to their knees, repent, and be cleansed by the blood of the Lamb. Yes. And it's only pride that will stop you from doing that, no matter what you have did before. Hallelujah. Can you think of... And that's throughout the Torah, throughout the priesthood, throughout the temple. It's all it's, the way, yeah. From the Garden of Eden all the way up through the end of Revelation. Can you think of two famous examples? Again, I like to... You know me, I'm going to try to network and tie this Just quickly, two names who went through that exact process. One was specifically put outside the camp until she repented, went through the cycle, and then got cleaned up. Who was that, Sharon? That's right, Miriam, Miriam, the sister of Moshe and Aharon. Who's another one? Those are clues. Samson. Also Uzziah. Ooh, there's a good one. That's a good one too. Yeah, Samson, also. 
Um, I've been in that area where those cities were and stuff like that. I mean, just think of where he was. Think of all the stuff he got right, all the stuff he got wrong. But at the very end, he's been blinded, hair cut off. He repents. Ask the Lord, can you do this one more time? I also think of Naaman the, Syri- the Syrian, where he had ah. baptized in the Jordan River seven times. And he's like, could it be anywhere else but there. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it's fantastic. We serve an amazing God. Okay. We really, really do. I'm also watching the time there, too. Okay, so we got through those. Now I'm going to put this one in. There we go. A little bit more math. It's hard for you to see a little bit of that. But uh, read the section called The Wilderness Years. Describe the relationship between Yahweh and Israel's cousin nations, which, okay, there's Edom, okay, there's Moab, and then you have up in here and over into here, okay. And then they threaded, this map doesn't show it as much, but there was a little bit of a wider path there, and they threaded right through and then entered in over there. We've kind of, kind of, kind of, kind of uh, covered that subject already, and which is fine. Yeah, and you guys covered it too a little bit also. They were forbidden to mess with their cousins, his family. You know. Now later on, the Lord did have them do things with, against them, but that was later. At this point, they weren't supposed to do that. And then... Uh, where were the lands of King Sihon and King Og, and what future role, if any, will either of these lands play for the nation of Israel? And I, put the, I took that picture uh, for a reason there. Um, my son and I were there, and, we, and it's at the end, if we get to that today, I do the little thing of a place in Israel or a place in Jordan. It's in there. But there's a reason why. That is a Soviet tank, and that was, it got this far, and then it got destroyed, in Israel, and it got all the way down from, from Syria when they invaded this 67, 67. So the lands of King Sihon would be Gilead, which is this area right over in here. King Og is up north. Today we know it as the Golan Heights. Okay, and if you watch the news over the, like, the last 20 years, it's a huge debatable thing. Um, that used to be the border of Syria was here, okay, right in the valley, and only part of the Israelis could only get to part of the Canara. They couldn't get to all of it. And there was a border right there, and they would be shot at quite often. When we were there, a lady who lived there, when that happened, we were at a little breakfast thing, and she showed us right where all that had happened, and she was there. So we got to go over and see some of the, they kept some of the old trenches and stuff so you, could, you don't forget, you don't forget, you remember. But they came down, um, the Israelites, excuse me, went back up in the 60s, when they conquered that area. They annexed it, and it's a huge debate on the planet that they should not have annexed it. But it's called the Golan Heights. There was a picture I had, you can see the, where it says Golan there. Okay. Right there. That's in the Golan Heights. They still don't know what it is. It's been there a long time. And it's, it's lined up perfectly with the solar system and the equinoxes. So they know it had to do with something there. But this would have been some of the stuff that they were practicing that was supposed to be wiped out. It's possible, but it's forbidden. There are several things we can do that are very possible, but they're forbidden. Okay, because of the evil that they do. We've talked about that several times during the Torah, like type of thing. I'll go back forward again. So, do you know, if anybody know of a future role, possibly the Golan Heights may play in the future. It still has not been fully fulfilled. It's not 100% certain, but it's highly probable. And I even uh, was able to have a good, good relations with some retired military people from Europe and from the Middle East. And uh, I finally suggested something, and they said, "You know, we've never studied that from a, from a, we've never studied that part of scripture from our army background." And so they did that, and they did some presentations, put them on the internet, and it was interesting to see the results they came up with. They were looking at Ezekiel 38 and 39 which is very real in Israel. That's in their face almost every week. They're always looking for it, always looking for it, always looking for it. And it's hard to see with this one, but there's the Golan Heights. 
and that is the most likely route that the invasion from the north at Gog and Magog will come right through the, the Golan. It could swing down some also, it could be multi-pronged, to come down through specifically the Golan, maybe the very northern tip of Gilead. But you can see the Middle East, this is where the invasion would be coming down. <clears throat> and then from here, it's most likely that they would come down through this area because of the mountains and, and the pathways. And then they would come down and sweep down. It probably could go right about there or right in here, okay? But they did a, a really good military analysis of it. And they were really surprised. <laughs> it was kind of fun. They got to mix their military career with their spiritual beliefs. And it turns out that even to this day, the IDF, their number one area, if they're worried about Israel being destroyed, it's from the north. They always know it's from the north. They've prepared for that. I'm not going to say what, because I know some of it, and it's confidential. But um, they know that. They're prepared for the south, but they know where it's coming. It's coming from the north. And they have heavily prepared for it. So it would be kind of interesting to see how that could be relevant for us even today. And then Deuteronomy 3, 21 and 22, I'd specifically asked on that one. That should be question, yeah, there we go. This is where you're going to take a principle and then apply it to your life today. This is the principle. I'll read 3, 21 and 22. And I commanded Yehoshua, that's Joshua, at that time saying, your eyes have seen all that Yahweh, your Elohim, has done to these two sovereigns. It's Og um, and the other guy, I forgot his name here. Uh, Yahweh does the same to all the reigns which you are passing over. Do not fear them, for Yahweh, your Elohim himself, fights for you. So how is this relevant to us today with Yeshua? Yes, Darren. Well, we're not to fear anything, and we're to let Yahweh fight for us. We aren't to be anxious. It's written we are not to be anxious in nothing. So even, even anxious to do what we think is right or or to be anxious, nothing. We wait on him, let him do the work, and we mm -hmm. don't do it our, ourselves. Because okay. our fight is not against flesh and blood, once again. Um, so we trust in him. We don't, uh, we don't fear um, what's happening in our government. Or, <laughs> or we don't fear the Muslims or anything else. We have Yeshua as our king and our Lord, and he's capable of handling anything. Mm -hmm. So anytime we we're worrying, that is sin. I believe that is sin. Mm -hmm. When we're worrying about this or that, that's lack of faith in our Lord. Hallelujah. Okay, what happened six months ago in Europe? Biggest thing since World War II, guys. Russia invaded Ukraine. It's the biggest thing, biggest war in Europe since 1945 when they got Hitler out. This thing is huge. What happened this last week? On the other side of the planet, it's going on right now. War is at the doorstep of Taiwan. Chinese fleets are doing exercises within the territorial waters of Taiwan saying, what are you going to do about it? They're within the, the, the international limit. They're hitting... There, they have six, six things going on there. They shot 11 ballistic missiles straight over Taiwan. I said, what are you going to do about it? Okay. They're not messing around. This has been brewing for a long time. So those guys were pretty big when he fought them in the... In, well, I'm supposed to have a map up there right now. Sorry. <laughs> when he fought those two kings on the right side, one of them was a giant. Okay. The real tall guys. The Anakims. They were huge. There were grasshoppers in their sight. That wasn't just an exaggeration. It's a slight one, but they also were really huge. Don't worry about it. I'll take care of them. To me, that's relevant to us today because we have the prophecies all over the Tanakh. Um, 
we, we looked to Revelation for the end times, but it's not the only one. It's heavily in Daniel, heavily in Ezekiel, Isaiah has major sections too. But timelines are in Daniel and Ezekiel. They're right there. And we need to believe in those and know that God is in control, okay? And he will take this stuff through that. To me, that makes it very relevant. And who's our gateway? Who's our doorway to the Father? Yeshua. You can't get to the Father except for through Yeshua. He's the gatekeeper. He's the gate. Okay? So when we see these things, I pay attention to them. But I don't, like you said, worry, but I am concerned. And so when I am concerned, what do I do? Go to Yahweh with it. Yes, ma'am. We have another one over here, too. Yeah. And we don't when the government tells us to shut down our worship. Thank you. I forgot that one. We go boldly forward and say, no way. Yes. And this congregation did that. We we chose to not close. There was a couple of individual days where it seemed like it was unsafe. But in that whole time, we did not close. In fact, three of the congregations, including this one, were were doing a lawsuit against the governor of Oregon saying, you overstepped your bounds. This is not right. Uh, Dr. Uh, John MacArthur in Southern California did the same thing with the state of California. Boy, I'll tell you, this is when you remember what God can do. So what is this? This is nothing. This is absolutely nothing. I have a story in here, but I want to hear what you had to say. Um, well, well, you know, as far as do not fear, Yeshua <laughs> says in Matthew six twenty five. Because of this, I say to you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or drink, about your body, what you shall put on. Is not life more than the food and the body more than the clothing? Look at the birds of the heaven, for they they neither sow nor reap nor gather in storehouses, yet your heavenly Father does feed them. And you not, or are you not worth more than they? And which of you, by worrying, is able to add one cubit to his lifespan? So why do you worry about clothing? Note well the lilies of the field, how they grow. They're neither toil nor spin. And, they, and I say to you that even Solomon, in all his esteem, was not dressed like one of these. But if Elohim so clothes the grass of the field, which exists today, and tomorrow thrown into the furnace, how much more you... O oh, you of little belief, do not worry then saying, what shall we eat? What shall we drink? What shall we wear? <laughs> for all these the Gentiles seek for, and your heavenly Father knows that you seek all these. But seek first the reign of Elohim and his righteousness, and all these matters shall be added to you. Do not then worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow shall have its own worries. Each day has enough evil of itself. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. That's very, very well said. I've got a lot of other scriptures in here, too. That says it the best. That they would just be redundant. So what I was going to do is uh, simply skip down to question number six, and that um, was a couple of things down there. It's a scholar question. I try to put a scholar question, dive in deep, right? Go do some word studies. Get some strong numbers thrown out there, that type of thing too. But it was read Deuteronomy 2, 20 and 21. And then chapter 3, verse 11. King Og Og was the last of what race? Actually, both these kings were a part of a group. They're called the Amorites. So I'm thinking group, not technically not DNA. The Rephaim. Okay, that's it. They're both. But the Amorites. In Deuteronomy 3.8, it says, And we took at that time out of the hand of the two kings of the Amorites the land that was on this side, Jordan, from the river of Arnon until Mount Hermon. Mount Hermon's that mountain way up in the north. For only Og, king of Bashan, remained of the remnants of giants. That's the Rephaim one. Behold, his bedstead was a bedstead of iron. It, is it not in Rabat of the children of Ammon? Nine cubits was the length thereof, and four cubits the breadth of it, after the cubit of a man. So what I wanted to do is I wanted to cover the Amorites. Remember, they, this on this one, they killed, them, they killed the men, women, and children. Okay? That seems to be very extreme, and it is very extreme. It, the Lord didn't do it all the time. However, the Lord reminded me of something, of why. It's in Genesis. This is what's fun. I love computer software because it speeds up word searching. 
And I'm going, Genesis, and it's 15, chapter 15, verses 13 through 21. See, I have fun with these questions, too. I get them in their inspiration. Sometimes I don't know the answers, or I'm going, I know that answer, but where is it? So I have fun doing these as well. It's fun. I'll start here. And he said unto Avram, know for surety that thy seed shall be a stranger in a land that is not theirs and shall serve them, and they shall afflict them 400 years. Okay, so this is a promise. 400 years before, and plus a little bit, 40, before they get here and they destroy them in our Torah portion. That's how long back this word is. Okay, long time back. And also that nation whom they shall serve will I judge, that's Egypt, and afterwards shall they come out with great substance, which they did. And, and, and thou shalt go to thy fathers in peace, he's talking to Avram, thou shalt be buried in a good old age, which he was <clears throat> in a cave uh, in the southern part of, of Israel today. But in the fourth generation they shall come hither again, here's the key, for the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet full. It took 400 plus years before the iniquity of the Amorites was full enough, the Lord would send them in to judge them as his judgment and kill them all off. It's all tied together. All tied together. Um, and it came to pass that when the sun went down and it was dark, I always love this part, behold a smoking furnace and a burning lamp that passed between those pieces. That's the animals that he had, he had split up. In the, in the uh, same day, Yahweh made a covenant with Avram, saying, Unto thy seed have I given this land from the river of Egypt unto the great river Euphrates. And remember, we are grafted into that promise. That's a key, huge promise. Okay? And now he names off the groups that are in it. The Kenites, the Kenizzites, the Kedmonites, there we go, and the Hittites, and the Parasites, and the Rephaims, which Og was one, and the Amorites, which both kings, tribes, the whole tribes, oops, the whole tribes were, oh dear, were that. And the Canaanites and the Girgashites and the Jebusites. And we talked about them. That was when Joshua got fooled and the princes that got fooled. The Jebusites fooled them. They were supposed to drive them out. Okay, so they did not, thank you, fulfill that promise. But this is all stuff that was in Genesis 400 and, you know, plus I think a little bit more. So I don't know about you, but I thought it was pretty exciting to see how the Lord was patient, waited, and then he fulfilled it. And then I had one other in here. It's in Amos, chapter 2, verse 9. And he's having them remember. Yet I destroyed the Amorite before them, whose height was like the height of the cedars. And he was as strong as the oaks, yet I destroyed his fruit from above and his roots from beneath. And I brought you up from the land of Mitzrayim, Egypt, and led you 40 years through the wilderness to possess the land of the Amorite. And this is a fulfillment of that. Okay? It's really cool. It all ties together. And the, the same God who did that will do it for us and for you on a personal level if you have problems and issues, difficulties, attacks, and he'll do it as a nation, as a, as a group. Hopefully, it would be the United States of America, but if it doesn't repent, all the believers, and we got brothers and sisters right now who are probably praying pretty heavily in Taiwan, and they have been praying in Ukraine and Belarus and Russia, because they don't want the war either. And they're getting jailed for it. So we all don't want this, and we're all joining together. We are part of that group, and the Lord will save us. And with that, I'll end today's Torah portion. We won't get into the cool place, but that's okay, because this is more important. And I'll save it for another week. Thank you for coming. Greatly appreciate it. We're going to take a break. We're going to change this up here a little bit, and then we'll have our regular service at 1130.